Took some of y'all down memory lane, huh? You know, it's, um, it's interesting because, you know, you see a lot of these shows over the years, and for some who might be a few years older, you remember some other family shows like uh, the Jeffersons and Good Times and the Bunkers and all of those. You know, it's interesting because these family sitcoms, they don't necessarily give us a blueprint for what the family's supposed to be. They simply reflect what the family typically looks like in the culture that we live in. Um, it typically is telling us how people are doing the best with the situation that they have. Um, but God has a blueprint for what the family should look like. God has a blueprint for our lives personally. God has a blueprint for what the family should look like. And it's when we stray from that blueprint that we begin to see some cracks in our foundation, some homes that are built with some flawed techniques. And what we're looking at today is, and will be for the next several weeks, is what is God's blueprint for the family? How is, is what does the Bible say about who we are individually, who, who we are as a husband and a wife? What does a marriage look like? What, how should a marriage be built? What, when you're dating, when you're uh, that single person and you're looking for that spouse to be, what are you looking for in someone? When you begin to have kids, what does that look like? What does is, what is a, a family look like? What does a family look like at different seasons of life? Uh, I was just having that conversation earlier today. You know, every season that you're in seems like the most difficult because it's the first time you've been there. Uh, having been through all of them, you know, you get to see from the, the newborn coming home to the adult children that are having children of their own. Um, there are challenges in every one of them, amen? Um, so we're going to look at this over the next few weeks and dive into what uh, what God says about, uh, about a family. Uh, you know, families matter. Uh, family's the basic unit of human relationship and foundational to both society and the church. Family. Strong churches have strong families. Strong nations have strong families. Family defines much of who I am and how I think. How I'm raised, what I'm brought... That's my normal. And here, what I have found over the years is you work with different, is I've worked with students for over 30 years. However you're raised, that's your normal. No matter how dysfunctional that normal might be, it's your normal. It impacts the way that you see things. If you had the honor and blessing of being raised in a godly family where you, you were raised early on to honor the Lord and to put Him first in your life, you, that's your normal. So family defines much of who I am and how I think. How we raise our children, you know, in fact, one of the things, we're, we're not raising kids, we're raising young adults. We're raising them to one day be independent of us. So how we do that helps define who they are and how they think as they grow. Families created by God to accomplish specific aspects of His will here on earth. When you look through Scripture, you see how God has worked through family over and over and over again. Family is at the heart of God. Throughout the Scriptures, it is revealed that families matter to God. In fact, Genesis reveals the birth of the family, Adam and Eve. God gave them the instruction to be fruitful and multiply. Through Noah, there was a generational covenant being made. The family was the first institution that God created before the church. Speaking of the church in Acts chapter 2, you see the birth of the church. But even within that, you see families coming together, gathering. We just finished the book of Malachi going through that series and in the last verse of that book, it says, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children's children to their fathers. God, families matter. 
Acts 2, 39, For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Paul gives instructions in several uh, books of the Bible about family. Now, if you, there are people obviously here who are single. There are people who are married with no kids. There are people who are married with kids. There are people who are empty nesters. There are people who are senior adults. We have the whole range here. But there's something in all this for you, especially I know Trina and I are moving into this next phase of parenting where all of our kids are grown and now we have six grandkids. Well, my vision for family, it, it hasn't changed. I'm just doing it now with grandkids and working through my kids. It looks a little different, but the main things haven't changed. So there's something here for everyone. Um, we're going to be in, we're going to start off this series, Proverbs chapter 24, uh, verses 3 and 4. Um, and again, talking about family, it says, by wisdom, chapter 24, verse 3, by wisdom, a house is built. Now, wisdom is, it's essential for establishing a strong family. Wisdom is not the accumulation of knowledge. Wisdom is correctly applying knowledge. When we're getting into how to build a family, how to raise kids, how to have a strong marriage, one of the things I've heard over and over again when people, when they have kids, you start having the first issues that they're dealing with, you'll hear people say, well, they didn't come with an instruction book. Yes, they did. We got one. Amen? And it, it's the thing, God gives us instruction on how to raise up children. God gives us instruction how to build a strong marriage. So, by wisdom, a house is built. By wisdom, we build, we put in place strong principles that will guide us in everything that we do. By wisdom, the house is built, and by understanding, it is established. Understanding provides stability. The, to the to the house it's where a home is thoughtful a home is supportive a, he, a home develops a home is considerate a home is that place where your kids come and they know that this is a place that they're always loved no matter what now many times in in your lives there's going to be or in, in as the sermon uh, sermon series goes on there's going to be many times where you're going to think well Chris, you don't know what kind of home I grew up in. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes, all right? But by wisdom, this is God's blueprint. This is how it's supposed to be done. By understanding, it's established. And he goes on and he says, By knowledge, the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. God desires to work, through, work in and through the family. God desires to develop the family and to bless the family. That's God's desire and plan for us, that we experience God's blessings in our marriages, in our family, through our children, and through grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And great, great, if God blesses you to live that long. Amen? So, God has a plan. So let's look in my family what that looks like. In my family... I identify and cast vision for my family. I identify and cast vision for my family. Now, let's look at three different groups here. One is the family I will establish one day. Students, singles, this is the family I will establish one day. What do you want that family to look like? Some of you can say, man, I, my family is strong. My, I have a good dad, have a good mom, they have a good marriage. I want a family like the one that I've grown up in. You, you, got, you have that strong example right there in front of you. Others might say, Chris, I, my family, it's been tough. It has not been ideal. We've lived in dysfunction. It has been very difficult. What do I do? Here's the great thing, and as I said, we'll talk more about it in a few minutes, but 
you get to pick and cast vision for what you want your family to be like. In fact, when I do premarital counseling, there's, there's a few things I talk about. One is salvation, spiritual growth. I find out when I, a couple comes to me and talks, I want to know where you're at in your walk with the Lord. We, we talk about that first. If you are a believer, tell me how you're growing in your walk with the Lord. Tell me how you and your fiancé, tell me how you're growing together in your walk with the Lord. That's the first thing that we talk about. Second thing is, I talk about what kind of family do you want? And many times they hadn't really thought about that. Everybody wants, oh, we just want a great marriage. Okay, well, what does that look like? What does a great marriage look like? One of the things I tell them is, look, to really help with this, to really get that picture in your mind so that you can, you can be very specific with it, think of three or four couples that you know, that you say, you know what, when I get to be there, I want a marriage that looks like that. I want a family that looks like that. I want a family that loves each other like that. Have that vision for what you want your family to be. Students, listen, you might say, well, I'm, I'm 15. There's no greater time to think about what you would look for in a spouse than right now. Because what it does, when you find out, when you can write down the qualities that you're looking for in a spouse, it gives you a much greater yes in here so that you can say no to a lot of other things. Now, our girls, we went through that. When they were middle school, uh, we went to this conference, and one of the things we did when we came back, we had every one of them write down the qualities they would look for in a spouse. I said, go to Scripture first. What does the Bible say that we should look for in a spouse? And I said, then if there are some other things you want to add to that, you can add to that. So they did. Each one of them, they developed that, that checklist and all, they cited the Scripture, and then they added some other things they were looking for. Now, as you know, middle schoolers, they're, you know, they're not, they're, they think it's something's really important. Like one of my daughters, not to be named, one of the most important things besides the Scripture thing was they had to have a British accent. And her husband is about as far away from having a British accent. <laughs> but what is awesome is that as we were going through those next few years after they did that, you know, they kind of didn't take long. I mean, when you, you know how it is. When you get older, you look at the things that were important to you when you were 13, and you're like going, oh, my gosh. But the biblical things and some of the, even the, the personal things they were looking at, it helped them to be able to say no to people that started showing interest in them because they weren't where they should be at that point in time. So it wasn't always mom and dad having to be the bad guy. We'd say, well, what do you think about this young man? I'd say, well, let's pull out your list. We'll pull out the list. We start going down the list. And I said, well, how's that looking? That's not looking so good, Dad. <laughs> so... It helped them to be able to make decisions on their own because they were. it was teaching them to go to Scripture and let Scripture be their guide, but it was also teaching them to own this decision on their own, and it's not just mom and dad saying yes or no. Because the Bible is our guide. The Bible is the handbook on dating and marriage. And if you want a relationship that honors God and blesses you and brings joy to your life, then follow God's Word, okay? So we talk about premarital counseling, salvation, spiritual growth, vision, communication. How do you talk to each other? How do you communicate to each other? Some people come from homes where they just yelled all the time. And the, the next one close to that is how do you handle conflict? You know, some people, when we talk, I mean, it's the yelling, screaming at each other. Uh, and things like that, and some come from good homes where it was modeled very successfully, but we talk about that. And then finances is the last one. Um, those are the big eggs in the basket that you need to be talking about before someone gets married because those are the things that will determine what your family looks like. It will, in, it will 
also, does your, will your family endure? So identify and cast vision for my family. The family I will establish one day. Second, the family I have already established. You can look at some of those things I just mentioned and say, how are we doing? Kind of like a mid-trip checkup. How am I doing in these things? And let me tell you, it's not just marriages that are struggling and families that are struggling that evaluate. We Listen, if you want to make sure that you stay healthy, what do you do every year? You go get a checkup, right? You're going and making sure that your body, things are going and you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Your body's responding. Same thing is true in a marriage. The strongest marriages that I know, the strongest families that I know, they're always going to marriage conferences. They're always going to family conferences. Why? Because they want to make sure they're doing the things that they're supposed to be doing. So the family I will establish one day, the family I've already established, and the family that needs to be reestablished. As we go through this family series, husbands and wives, you may look at each other and say, we've gotten off track. And, and we, we need to do a course correction. Mom, dad, there may need to be a course correction. Students, you may, as we start doing this family thing, you may look at what's going on and you say, you know what? I, I'm not honoring my parents like I should be. They're, they've been trying to help me with something and I'm not responding like I should be responding. So sometimes there needs to be a course correction. Sometimes we need to reestablish the principles that God would have us do in our lives. That comes from a heart of humility. A heart of humility will allow somebody to say, you know what, I'm wrong and I need to change. And that has to be true of you no matter what age you are. So identify and cast vision for your family. The next thing. I have the choice to either maintain or change my family's spiritual culture and legacy. Excuse me for a second. Um, I have the choice to either maintain or change my family's spiritual culture or legacy. Now, I'll just speak personally. My parents, there was some dysfunction in their homes. So when they were growing up, they had to deal with some things that weren't healthy. And they did. And because they dealt with those things, my parents made a commitment that they would raise kids in a home that was loving, supportive, and functional. And they did. Some of you may be in that situation right now. And you say, Chris, the home I'm in doesn't honor God. The home I'm in, the home I came from, it, it wasn't what it was supposed to be. But you know what? You have the freedom to make a choice. You can change. When I look out across this congregation right now, there are, are many of you that I know that you made a choice to change and break cycles of dysfunction in your life so that you could honor God personally. You could honor God in your marriage and in your family. So we have that choice to maintain, to continue it on, to perpetuate, or we can change it. The other thing, next one. I choose to build a strong family based on the principles of God's Word. I choose to build a strong family based on the principles of God's Word. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, you know, uh, Jesus said, Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the wind blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. See, here's the thing that you notice. The people that built their house on the rock, the people that built their house on the sand, both had to weather storms. One made it through, the other didn't. 
storms are coming in all of our lives. Amen? Life is not easy, nor is life fair. But God tells when we build our lives, when we build our marriages, when we build our families on the rock, on God's Word, we will endure. We will have victory over the, the problems, over the adversity that comes into our lives. But the thing is, we have to make a choice that we're going to build our lives on that rock. That's a choice we have to make. We live in a culture now that says, well, you know, you can get carried away with that stuff. Do you really have to do all that? Can't you just kind of do it? I mean, mom, dad, listen, just showing up here once a week or just dropping the kids off on Wednesday night, that's not going to cut it. Casey does a great job in our children's, preschool children's ministry. Caleb does a great job in our student ministry. He's not, they're not their parents. Listen, God created the institution of family first. He created the institution of the church. The church is to come alongside families and equip and develop them so they can be strong, they can, they can endure. The church was never meant to take the place of parents. We, we can't, and, and we'll talk about this in a later message, the church was never meant to be a drop-off place like you drop your kids off to get guitar lessons. You drop your kids off at football practice so they can become better football players. You drop your kids off at baseball so they can become better baseball players. That is not what church is supposed to be. The church can be the greatest partner that you have in building a strong family and raising strong kids. Caleb can be the best friend you've ever had because he is going to come alongside you and he is going to support you. He is going to help train up, help you come alongside you, training up your children. That's what student, best friends you have ever had. And they both do a great job in creating those kind of things. When they do events, when they do the, the camps and stuff, they're always sending stuff home so mom and dad can, okay, here's what they learned. Now let's take this into the home and how can we, how can we continue this once they get home? So it's, it's a partnership there. But building on that rock, building on God's word, this is where we got to be. Second, uh, Second Timothy 3, 16, Paul tells Timothy, this young pastor, he says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. This is sufficient. This is sufficient. Everything you need is here. It's here. Now let's put it into practice. I choose to build a strong family based on the principles of God's Word. The next point. I should expect God's blessings for my family. I should expect God's blessings for my family. God desires to bless. God desires to work in and through you to have a wonderful marriage, to have a God-honoring marriage, to have a, a children that honor God and all they do. But the world tends to want to say, you know what, you can get carried away with that. We can do this. You don't have to do all of that stuff. You know, let's, let's, let's do some of this. It's funny how the world creeps its way into the church. It's funny how the world can creep their way into the pulpit. You notice when Jesus warned about false cheap teachers, he said they would be what in sheep's clothing? Wolves. Okay, Paul, when he warned about false teachers, where were they? They were in the church. Now, be careful. Just because it says Christian on it doesn't mean it's biblical. You have to be discerning. All right? God is calling us to something greater. The, the, his word is sufficient. But his word also is like that GPS. It's telling you the way to go. Now you can choose to depart from it. 
but you're taking a course that is not going to get you to your destination. I should expect God's blessings for my family. John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come that they may have life and have it abundantly. God's plan is for you to experience an abundant life in your family. Now, the thief is going to say, Well, you know what? It won't hurt. You know, church can be part of it, but maybe you need to do this and do, so they can be well-rounded. Listen. What he said here in 2 Timothy, that all scriptures breathe out by profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete. The word of God is sufficient. Make sure that you don't buy into something else taking the place of God's word and the role of the church in the development of your marriage and your family. Last point. I will boldly proclaim, I will live and lead my family according to God's ways. I, I know that when, you know, when we read in Scripture, like in Joshua uh, 24, he's taught, and I'm going to read this in just a second. You know, we think about false idols, and we think, well, you know, we don't have, we're not worshiping false idols in our home. We don't, we don't have a pagan religion and all you might not know it. It's, it's subtle. What, what are those things? It's the things that take us away from God. It's the thing that takes His place in our lives. It's when good things try to take the place of the main thing. It's when something that in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with it, but when it begins to consume us and it begins to take God's place in our life, then it is wrong. Then it becomes an idol. Then it begins to take us places that we never intended to go. Good things become bad things when they take the place of the main thing. What can that be? I've seen it be many things. I've seen it be careers. I've seen it be hobbies. I've seen it be sports. I, I mean, you can kind of... But in and of itself, is it, a, is it an evil thing? No. When did it become a bad thing? When it began to take the place of the main thing. I've watched families, especially here over this last 15 years, get caught up in wh whatever kind of sport that it is. And I love sports. I played sports all my life. But when sports, which is a good thing, begins to take the place of the main thing, it becomes a bad thing. I've watched families disappear for five years. And then mom and dad thinking, well, when we get done with this, then we'll, we'll come back to church. I can't tell you how many families that I have counseled with over the years Mom and dad came back, but the kids never did. Why? Because we've demonstrated over five years that church can be optional when there's something we feel like is more important. We can also do that in our careers when we use the pursuit of success to pull us out of our of our church and pull us out of our, our intense walk with God and, and church becomes an optional thing because pursuit of success is the main thing. Success can be a great thing, but it becomes a bad thing when it takes the place of the main thing. So that's why I can't give you a list. Well, now make sure you stay away from all these. There's no, you can't do that. It's legalistic and it's wrong. But my idol can be something that's completely different from yours. And it doesn't have to be inherently evil. It's something that pulls us away from God. So in our lives, we have to boldly proclaim that I personally will live for the Lord and I will lead my family to do the same thing. Joshua made this declaration. Joshua 24, verse 15. 
He says, and if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord. And I used to wonder about how he started that. How could people see it be evil in their eyes to serve God? We're living in a time right now that many things that are biblical, people in the world will say, that's awful, and will condemn Christians for standing on God's Word. Well, Joshua just started out. He says, if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers that served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua stood out in his day because he drew a line, a hard line. And he said, my family is going to be about serving the Lord. It might not be popular. It might not be the end thing. It might not be the thing that gets likes on Instagram. But this is what we're doing. This is what we're about. Joshua boldly proclaimed. Now, you would think, you would think that that would have, in all that God did in and through Joshua's life to impact Israel, you would think that that would have really made an impact and the whole people would have changed. But l listen to this. Joshua, I'm going to read a, a fairly lengthy passage right here in verses 6 through 10. It says, When Joshua dismissed the people of, uh, dismissed the, people, the people of Israel went back each to his own inheritance to take possession of the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. In other words, everybody was faithful while Joshua was alive. Everybody was faithful while the, all the elders were still alive who all witnessed God's miraculous work as he led them out of Egypt. As God provided for them all the miracles, the manna, everything. Everybody stayed faithful while those people were still alive. Because they were telling the story about God's faithfulness. But then, it says, verse 8, And Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years. And they buried him within the boundaries of his inheritance in timnath in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gaash. Verse 10 is one of the most impactful verses in Scripture. It says, And all that generation also gathered to their fathers. They died. And then there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that He had done for Israel. We had failed to pass the baton. In fact, that's kind of a, a, a current subject right now in the track that happened. The baton didn't get passed like it should have. And what happened? Disqualified. They, they were out. It was an L, yeah. God, each generation has the responsibility to pass their faith on to the next. Now, we're going to preach. Listen, we're going to preach and teach the Word here. We're, I would love for every seat in here to be filled. I, I, I would love it but that's not why I'm preaching. When we talk about love God, love people, and make disciples, that's why we're here. I, I, I'm not, we don't, we're not driven by the numbers. We're driven by changed lives. We want to teach people how to pass the baton of faith. There is nothing more important that you will do in your life than to teach your children how to be faithful to the Lord. How to teach your children how to walk with Jesus. Because, yes, you can teach it with your mouth, but what you do in your life will speak much louder than what you say. It's the old John Maxwell quote. You teach what you know, you reproduce who you are. There was a lady, Mary Pfeiffer, in her article entitled The Generation Gap, had this insightful quote. It says, When any culture, community, or family cannot effectively pass on its heritage to the next generation, they will not endure. When values cannot be clearly articulated and exhibited, cultures, communities, or families cease to maintain 
their distinctive traits that make them unique, that differentiate them from others. When heritage is not passed on to succeeding generations, they lose their distinctiveness, grow insignificant, and are doomed to gradual assimilation into the culture at large. Summary, when the church stops living their life for Jesus, we look more like the world than like Jesus. Students, let me, let me say this to you. If you live your life for Jesus, you're going to stand out. You're going to be different. Okay? That's a good thing. Right now, we live in a world where people build fake lives on social media and promote it like this is real, and it's not. And our desire to compare and to fit in, and it overrides what we know to be true about living our lives for Jesus. If you live your life for Jesus, you will stand out. You will be different. And that is okay. Mom, Dad, if you parent, if your marriage, if you're valuing Jesus in your life, you will look different than other parents. If you parent your kids according to God's Word, you're going to look different than other parents. You're going to get ribbed a lot. What, what do you mean you're not letting them do? Well, everybody's... Come, come on, you need to loosen up. You can't shelter your kids. You ever heard that? There's a reason there's greenhouses, right? You grow plants and get them to the point to where they can survive on their own, right? That's what the home is supposed to be to nurture, to build up, to disciple children so that they can be prosperous in the world that we live in. Not to throw them out and let them be just one more victim to the world that we live in. Guys, God has called us to be different. God has called us to be the ones that just step out boldly and say, as for me, and my house, we will serve the Lord. No qualifications, no, no small, no footnotes. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Doesn't matter if it's popular, doesn't matter if it's easy, doesn't matter if it's hard. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's a declaration. Now, I wonder for you, students, right now it's just, as for me, right? You're not married. As for me, I will serve the Lord. Are, are you ready to make that statement? I, I don't care what this does, popularity at school. I don't care what this does. As for me, I'm going to serve the Lord. Mom and dad in your home, are you prepared to boldly declare, as for me, and for my house, we will serve the Lord. You're leading the way. Now, I know that many in our congregation, we're not all coming from the same background. Some had godly examples that you follow. All right? Some didn't. But can I tell you, the Bible is full of people that come from every imaginable scenario and God changed their lives and worked in them and through, through, through them to bless them. So it doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter where you are right now. It doesn't matter what's going on in your family. God desires to have a relationship with you and to work in and through you. It's, it's not going to come easy. It's not going to come quick. In fact, all those videos that we saw, or all those shows that we saw earlier, you, you look at, at Full House and Family Matter, Boy Meets World, Sweet Life, Drake and Jot, Reeve, I mean, the, the common thing that they all had was that in 30 minutes, whatever problem there was, it was fixed. Right? 30 minutes. Didn't matter how bad the problem was, in 30 minutes, we got it fixed and all's good. Does life work like that? It does not. 
where it does begin is you making a decision to say, you know what? You can say, I like where we are right now. We're on the right track. We're not perfect. There's no perfect families in here. But I like the track we're on. I like the direction we're headed. We need to tune some things up. We need to refine some things. But we're going. Others may say, you know what, Chris? In my life, we need to make some changes and we're going to make them right now. We're not headed in the direction we need to but we're getting ready to turn to that direction and we're getting ready to press down the gas pedal because we're headed full steam ahead. But it begins with your decision. And for you to make a decision like that, it requires humility. It requires dads, you telling your family, look, I've made some mistakes. I haven't been the leader that I need to be in my home. I've been passive, and my wife has been doing it. It's a hard thing to say, but it's where spiritual renewal begins. That needs to happen. Single moms, dad isn't in the picture. You've been having to do this by yourself. Sometimes you feel alone. Sometimes you feel like, I don't think I can do this. I want you to know, Holy Spirit is your helper. He's the one who will strengthen you. He's the one who will enable you. He's the one who's going to bring other believers alongside of you that will be encouragers to you. This is where the church is part of. See, you have your family, and then you have the family of God, the universal family of God for all believers, but you have your church family. It's all about family. It always has been and it always will be. So I don't care where you come from, where you're at right now. God desires to bless you for you, as Jesus said in John 10, 10, for you to experience that abundant life. So this morning, we're going to have our invitation time. You may need to come to the altar and just say, God, thank you for what you've done in our life. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your protection. Lord, give me the strength, give my wife and I the strength to carry on. Single mom, you might be saying, Lord, you've delivered me through a lot. It hasn't been perfect, but I love where we're going. God, thank you for that. There may be others that need to say, Lord, I've got some conversations I need to have when I get home. Give me wisdom to know what to say and give me the strength to say it. The only thing worse than allowing dysfunction to come into family is knowing it's there and doing nothing about it. We all can turn it around. We all can desire and make the changes that we need to make. So I don't know where you are, and I don't know what needs to happen, but I know that in our congregation, there are some things that we need to take care of. Let me pray for you, and then we're going to have our invitation time. Father God, Lord, I thank you that you are faithful. I thank you as we've studied through the book of Malachi over the past several weeks, God. We've learned that you're faithful even when we're not. We've learned that you love us even when we're unlovable. And God, your desire is to strengthen family. Lord, you know every heart, every situation in this room this morning. And Father God, I just lift everyone up to you. And Lord, as I said a moment ago, I pray that you, your Holy Spirit would work in our hearts and minds, that you would give us wisdom to know what we need to do. And Father, I pray that you would give humility and I pray that you would give strength. Lord, I pray that our church would honor you with how we live our lives individually, how our families live for you, 
in how our families model faith for the community that we live in. Lord, I lift them up to you now. And Lord, I pray for your blessings. Your, your word tells us that when we delight ourselves in you, you give us the desires of our heart. And Lord, that's my prayer for our congregation this morning. In Jesus' name. I want to ask everybody if you would to please stand. Our pastors and other leaders are up here at the front. I want to ask you to respond this morning as God has laid it on your heart. If you need somebody to pray with you, there's going to be somebody here. If you need somebody to talk to, there's going to be somebody here. Over the next few weeks, I'm going to be very specific on things we can do in each one of the situations we talked about. The point is, is that we don't stay where we are, but we honor God in everything that we do and everything that we are.